Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to a read aloud of today's ELA story titled Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This being our second Sherlock Holmes story in the unit. Now, before we begin the story proper, just want to let you know real quick this word carbuncle, if you've never seen it before. Uh, a carbuncle, if you don't know, is can be thought of as like a big lump or a big boil or like a big pimple that appears on your skin, usually due to some bacterial infection. So it may seem like an odd name for a story, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. What's that about? Furthermore, you may be wondering why there's a picture of a goose with a big blue gemstone in its chest. Once again, these are questions that will be answered when we get into the story proper. So let's waste no time and let's get into it, everybody. The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, our second Sherlock Holmes story. Once again, narrated by Dr. Watson, uh, Sherlock Holmes's assistant. Here we go. I called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes on the second morning after Christmas to wish him a happy holiday. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown among a pile of crumpled morning newspapers. He was peering through a magnifying glass at an old shabby black hat, cracked in several places. Am I interrupting you? I asked. Not at all. I'm glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my findings. I sat down in his, his armchair and warmed my hands before his crackling fire. A sharp frost had set in, and the windows were thick with ice crystals. I suppose, I remarked, that homely as it looks, that hat or that, that hat has some deadly story linked to it. Is it the clue that will guide you to the solution of a mystery, or the punishment of a crime? No, no, no crime, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. Only one of those odd little events that happen when you have four million people crowded together within the space of a few square miles. You know Peterson, the commissionaire? Yes. This trophy belongs to him. Oh, is it his hat? No, no, he found it. No one knows who the owner is. Watson, don't look at it as just a battered billycock. Instead, see it as an interesting problem. Peterson brought it here on Christmas morning, along with a good fat goose. The facts are these. About four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson, a very honest fellow, was coming home from a holiday party. In front of him, he saw a tall man carrying a white goose over his shoulder. As the man reached the corner of Goodge Street, a group of roughs attacked him. One knocked off his hat, so the man raised his stick to defend himself, but when he swung the stick over his head, he accidentally smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger from his attackers, but the man, shocked at having broken the window and seeing an official-looking person in uniform running towards him, dropped his goose and took to his heels. The roughs also ran away, and so Peterson was left with this battered hat and a marvellous Christmas goose. Which Peterson surely returned to the man, right? I asked. My dear fellow, there lies the problem. For Mrs. Henry Baker was printed upon a small card which was tied to the bird's leg. You can see the initials HB upon the lining of this hat. But there are hundreds of Henry Bakers in this city of ours. I will not be easy to return the hat and the goose to the right man. Wait, then, what then did Peterson do? Peterson knows that even the smallest problems interest me, so he brought me the goose and the hat. The goose had to be eaten before it spoiled, so he took it home. I, of course, have the man's hat, and I would like to return it to him along with his Christmas dinner. How on earth will you figure out who he is? Not from his hat. Precisely so. But you're joking. What can you gather from his old uh, battered felt? Here is my magnifying glass. You know my methods. What can you find out yourself about the man who has worn this hat? So there's Sherlock Holmes again, being able to tell details about people just by looking at articles of their clothing. I took the tattered object in my hands and turned it over. It was a very ordinary black hat of the usual round shape, though much the worse for wear. The lining had been of red silk, but was now spotted and stained. There was no maker's name, but as Holmes had remarked, the initials HB were written on the inside. For the rest, it was cracked, very dusty, worn in several places, though it appeared that the owner had smeared the worn patches with ink to hide them. I can see nothing, said I, handing it back to my friend. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. But you fail to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. Please tell me, what can you infer from this hat? 
Holmes picked up the hat and gazed at it. Obviously, this man was fairly well-to-do within the last three years, but he has now fallen upon hard times. That may be why his wife is angry with him. My dear Holmes. Still, he cares what people think of him. He mostly stays at home, and he is out of shape. He has grizzled hair, which he has had cut within the last few days, and which he smoothed with lime cream. You are certainly joking, Holmes. Not in the least. It is possible that you do not see how I reach these conclusions. I must confess that I'm unable to follow you. This hat is three years old. These flat rims curled at the edge were fashionable then. It is a hat of the very best quality. If this man could afford to buy such an expensive hat three years ago, and has had no new hat since, then he has certainly gone down in the world. Well, that is clear enough, I said. But what about the rest? That he stays at home and is out of shape and has grizzled hair that has been recently cut and that he uses lime cream. How do you know all this stuff, Mr. Holmes? All of that you can see when you look through a magnifying glass. Look, there are a number of hair ends, clean cut by a barber's scissors. They're quite sticky, and the whole hat smells of lime cream. This dust is not the gritty, grey dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of the house, showing that it has been hung up indoors most of the time. The marks of moisture upon the inside are proof positive that the wearer perspires a lot while walking, so he is probably not in good shape. Perspires being another word for sweats, so he sweats when he walks. <laughs> but his wife, you said that she was angry with him. This hat has not been brushed for weeks. My dear Watson, when you have a week's worth of dust upon your hat, and when your wife allows you to go out that way, I will fear that you will also have made her quite upset. But he might be a bachelor meaning he might just not be married. No, remember the card on the bird's leg, which said, For Mrs. Henry Baker. He was bringing home, uh, he was bringing home the goose as a peace offering to his wife. Right, Mrs.? You're very clever, said I, laughing. But no crime has been committed. No harm has been done except the loss of a goose and an old hat. All of this seems to be rather a waste of energy. As Sherlock Holmes opened his mouth to reply, the door flew open, and Peterson, the man from Holmes's story, the commissionaire, rushed into the apartment. His cheeks were flushed, and he was dazed with astonishment. The goose, Mr. Holmes, the goose, he gasped. What of it? By the looks of it, you must have gotten up from its platter and flapped off through the window. No, see here, sir. See what my wife found in its crop. Peterson opened his hand and showed a sparkling blue stone. It was smaller than a bean but so brilliant that it twinkled like a star in the dark hollow of his hand. Sherlock Holmes sat up with a whistle. Peterson, that is a treasure indeed. Do you know what you have there? A diamond, sir? A precious stone? It's more than a precious stone. It is THE precious stone. Not the Countess of, Mor of Morcar's blue carbuncle, I cried. Precisely so, said Holmes. It was stolen just a few days ago, wasn't it? I asked. Precisely so, on December 22nd, just five days ago, replied Holmes. John Horner, a plumber, was accused of having stolen from the Countess's jewel case. I have some articles about it here, I believe. Holmes rummaged among his newspapers. At last, he smoothed one out and read. Hotel Cosmopolitan Jewel Robbery John Horner, 26, a plumber, was arrested on the charge of having stolen from the Countess of Morcar the valuable gem known as the Blue Carbuncle. So that's the blue carbuncle, the blue stone. James Ryder, head attendant at the hotel, said that he had shown Horner to the Countess's dressing room on the day of the robbery to fix a pipe. He stayed with Horner for a while, but then was called away. When Ryder returned, he found that Horner had disappeared and that the bureau had been forced open. Also, a small case in which the Countess kept her jewel was lying empty upon the dressing table. Ryder called the police. Horner was arrested that evening, but the stone was not found on him or at his home. The arresting officer reported that Horner struggled frantically and strongly declared his innocence. At the court hearing, evidence was given that the prisoner had been previously convicted of robbery. Horner, who was greatly upset, fainted away and was carried out of court. Hmm. So John Horner, this plumber, is the one who people think stole the blue carbuncle five days ago. Is that true? And if so, then how did it end up inside the belly of a goose uh, and end up in Peterson's hands here? Hmm. Hum, so much for the police, said Holmes thoughtfully. The question for us is, how did the Countess's blue carbuncle travel from her jewelry case to Mr. Henry Baker's Christmas goose? 
Let us try the simplest way first. We will advertise in the evening newspapers. If this fails, we will have to try another method. Please pass a pencil and a slip of paper, Watson. Now then. And on paper, this is what Holmes writes. Found at the corner of Gouge Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have them by coming to 221B Baker Street at 6.30 this evening. That is very clear, I said. But will make Mr. Baker see it? Well, he is sure to keep an eye on the papers, since, to a poor man, the loss was a heavy one. Everyone to whom he told the story will see his name in the ad and show it to him. Here you are, Peterson. Run down to the newspapers and have this ad put in tonight. Very well, sir. And the stone? Ah, yes. I will keep the stone. Thank you. And I say, Peterson, please buy a goose on your way back and leave it here with me. We must have one to give to this gentleman in place of the one your family is now enjoying. After Peterson left, Holmes took up the stone and held it against the light. It's a pretty thing, said he. See how it glitters and sparkles. Of course, it is a magnet for crime. This tiny piece of crystallized charcoal has already been the subject of several robberies and murders. Who would think that so pretty a toy would send men to prison? I'll lock it up in my strong box and send a message to the Countess to say that we have it. Holmes, I asked, do you think that the plumber, Horner, is innocent? I'm not sure. Well then, do you think Henry Baker had anything to do with the crime? I think Henry Baker is absolutely innocent. He probably has no idea that the bird he carried was more valuable than a goose made of solid gold. But I will know that when the man answers the advertisement. And you can do nothing until then? Nothing. In that case, I shall return to my patience. But I shall come back at 6.30, for I should like to see the solution to this tangled case. Very glad to see you. I dine at seven. There is perhaps there is a turkey, I believe. But before she starts cooking, perhaps I ought to ask Mrs. Hudson to examine the bird's crop. Part two. It was a little after half past six when I returned to Baker Street. As I neared the house, I saw a tall man waiting outside Holmes's door. Just as I arrived, the door was opened, and we were shown up together to Holmes's room. Mr. Henry Baker, I believe, said Holmes, rising from the armchair. Please, take this seat by the fire. It is a cold night. Ah, Watson, you've just come at the right time. Now, Mr. Baker, is that your hat? Yes, sir, it certainly is, Henry Baker ran his hand through his grizzled hair. I noticed the scent of lime cream. We kept these things for some days, said Holmes, because we expected to see an advertisement from you giving your address. Why didn't you advertise? Our visitor laughed sheepishly. Shillings are not so plentiful with me as they once were. I thought that the gang of roughs who attacked me and carried off both my hat and the bird. I thought it would be a waste of money to try to get them back. Of course. By the way, about the bird, we had to eat it. <laughs> to eat it? The visitor half rose from his chair in excitement. Yes, it would have spoiled if we hadn't. But here is another goose. It is about the same weight and perfectly fresh. Will it do? Oh, certainly, certainly, answered Mr. Baker, sighing with relief. Of course, we still have the feathers, legs, crop, and so on of your own bird, if you wish. The man burst into a hearty laugh. They might be useful as souvenirs of my venture, he said, but beyond that, they are of no use to me. Sherlock Holmes glanced sharply at me with a slight shrug of his shoulders. Hmm. There is your hat, then, and there is your bird, he said. By the way, would you tell me where you got the other one? I have never seen a better goose. Certainly, sir, said Baker, tucking the goose under his arm. I bought it from a man named Windigate at the Alpha Inn. He clapped his hat upon his head, thanked us, and went off upon his way. So much for Mr. Henry Baker, said Holmes. Or, so much for Mr. Henry Baker, said Holmes. Gotta give him his British accent, when he had closed the door behind him. He knows nothing about the jewel, but would you like to follow up on his clue while it is still hot? By all means, I replied. We trudged through the snow to the Alpha Inn. Holmes walked to the bar and ordered two glasses of ale from the ruddy-faced, white-aproned landlord. So at this time we have determined that uh, Henry Baker doesn't uh, never really knew that the blue carbuncle was inside of his goose that he had. But Holmes is, is now following up on the lead that he got, Mr. Baker telling him where he bought that goose. So where did the goose that had the blue carbuncle in its belly first come from? It came from a guy named... Or, I don't know if we know the guy's name, but... Uh, Win well, Windigate was his name, at the Alpha Inn. So this is where the goose was originally bought. 
Your air should be excellent if it is as good as your geese, said he. My geese? The man seemed surprised. Yes, I just spoke to Mr. Henry Baker. He said he'd bought this goose from you. Ah, yes, I see. Uh, sorry, sir, but them's not our geese. Indeed? Whose are they, then? Well, I got the two dozen from a salesman in Covent Garden. Indeed? I know some of them. Who was it? Breckenridge was his name. Ah, I don't know him. Well, here's to your good health, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Good night. As we came at us in the frosty air, Holmes buttoned his coat and said, Now for Mr. Breckenridge. Remember, Watson, even though we have only a goose at this end of the chain, at the other end there is a man who will spend years in prison unless we can prove that he is innocent. Part 3 Holmes and I hurried to the Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls had the name Breckenridge written on it. The salesman was helping a boy put up the shutters. Good evening. Sold out of geese, I see, said Holmes pointing at the bare slabs of marble. Fine birds they were, too. Where did you get them from? To my surprise, the salesman was suddenly furious. Now then, mister, what do you want? Let's have it straight now. It's straight enough. I want to know who sold you your geese. Well, then I won't tell you, so now. Oh, it's not important. So why are you so upset over such a small thing? Upset? You'd be upset, too, if you were as pestered as I am. When I pay good money for a good goose, that should be the end of the business. But all day long it's been... Where are the geese? And who did you sell the geese to? And what will you take for the geese? You'd think there were only geese in the world to hear the fuss that's been made over them. Well, I don't know who else has been asking, said Holmes casually. If you won't tell us, the bet is off, that's all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on the matter of geese, and I have a fiver on it, that the bird I ate is country bread. Well, then you've lost your fiver, for it's town bread, snapped the salesman. <laughs> it's nothing of the kind. I say it is. I don't believe it. Do you think you know more about geese than I, who've been handled them ever since I was in Nepa? I tell you, those birds were town bred. You'll never persuade me to believe that. Will you bet then? asked the salesman. It would be taking your money, because I know I'm right, but I'll bet a sovereign, just to teach you not to be so obstinate. The salesman snorted. Bring me the book, Bill, he said. The boy brought out a, grease, uh, a great greasy volume. He laid it beneath the lamp. Now then, Mr. Know-it-all, said the salesman, you see this book? Well, that's the list of folk from whom I buy. Do you see? Well, then, here on this page are the country folk I buy from. And now then, you see this other page in red ink? Well, that is a list of my town suppliers. Now, look at that third name. Just read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, Egg and Poultry Supplier, said Holmes. Quite so. Now, read the last entry. December 22nd, 24 geese at 7 shillings. Quite so. There you are. And underneath? Sold to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha Inn at 12 shillings. What do you have to say now, Mr. Know-it-all? Sherlock Holmes drew a sovereign from his pocket and threw it down upon the slab. He turned away as though he was disgusted. But a few yards off, he stopped under a lamppost and laughed in his hearty, silent way. When you see a man with a horse racing form sticking out of his pocket, you can always get him to talk with a bet, said he, chuckling. Just then, a loud hubbub broke out from the stall that we had just left. Turning round, we saw Breckenridge shaking his fist at a little rat-faced fellow. I've had enough of you and your geese, Breckenridge shouted. If you come pestering me again, I'll set the dog at you. Ha, huh, this may save us a visit to Brixton Road, whispered Holmes. Come with me. Let's see who this fellow is. Holmes strode through the crowd and touched the little man on the shoulder. The man jumped and turned around, his face pale. "'You will excuse me,' said Holmes blandly, "'but I could not help overhearing your conversation with the salesman. Perhaps I can help you?' "'Who are you?' asked the man in a quavering voice. "'How could you know anything of the matter?' "'My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know.' "'But you can know nothing of this.' Excuse me, I know everything about it. You're trying to trace a goose sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Road to a salesman named Breckenridge, by him in turn to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha, and by him to Mr. Henry Baker. Oh, sir, you're just the man I'm looking for, cried the little fellow, almost in tears. Of course, but please tell me who it is that I have the pleasure of helping. The man paused for a moment. My name is John Robinson, he answered in a very sly glance. No, your real name, Holmes Sweet, said Holmes sweetly. It is always awkward doing business with a false one. The stranger blushed. Well then, he said, my real name is James Ryder. Sherlock Holmes hailed a cab. 
Precisely so, the head attendant of the Hotel Cosmopolitan, where the blue car bunker was stolen from. Please step into the cab. I shall soon be able to tell you everything you wish to know. Part 4 In a half hour, we were back at Baker Street. Here we are, said Holmes cheerily as we filed into his rooms. Now then, I want to know what became of a white goose with a black bar across the tail. Ryder trembled. Oh, sir, he cried. Can you tell me where it went to? It came here. Here? Yes. And it was a most amazing bird. I'm not surprised that you want to find it. You know, it laid an egg after it was dead. The prettiest, brightest little blue egg ever seen. Holmes unlocked his strong box and held up the blue carbuncle, which outshone like a star. Ryder's eyes bulged with fear. The game's up, Ryder, said Holmes quietly. You had heard of the Countess's blue bark carbuncle, had you not? Her maid told me about it, Ryder said in a crackling voice. I see. Well, the temptation of sudden wealth was too much for you. But you were not very careful in the means you used. You knew that this man Horner, the plumber, had been convicted of robbery before. So you damaged the pipes in the Countess's room, then sent for Horner. When the gem was stolen, you knew that everyone would suspect him. After he left, you cracked open the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had the poor man arrested. Ryder threw himself down on the rug and clutched at Holmes's knees. Have mercy, he shrieked. Think of my parents. It would break their hearts. I never went wrong before. I never will again. I swear it. I swear it on a Bible. Oh, don't bring it to court, please. Get back into your chair, said Holmes sternly. It is very well to cringe and crawl now, but you thought little of this poor Horner being punished for a crime he did not commit. I will go away, Mr. Holmes. I will leave the country. Then the charge against him will break down. Hum. We will talk about that. Now let us hear the true story of how the stone got into the goose, and how the goose got to the market. Tell us the truth, for that is your only hope of safety. I will tell you what happened, sir, he said he. When Horner was arrested, I knew I had to get away with the stone at once. I did not know if the police would search me in my room, too. The hotel wasn't safe, so I went to my sister's house. She and her husband, a man named Oakshot, raised geese for market. Ryder passed his tongue over his parched lips, and then continued. I have a friend who was once a thief. I knew that if I took the stone to him, he would show me how to sell the stone for money. But the police could stop me and search me at any time. How could I keep the jewel safe? I remembered then that my sister told me that I might have my pick of her geese for a Christmas present. So I went into the goose yard and caught a big white bird with a barred tail. I pried its bill open and thrust the stone into its throat. The bird gulped, and I felt the stone pass into its crop. Then it broke loose and fluttered off among the others. I told my sister which goose I wanted. She said I could take it with me. So I caught it and took it to my friend. But when we cut open the goose, my heart turned to water. There was no sign of the stone. I rushed back to my sister's and hurried into the yard. But there was not a bird to be seen. She told me they had all gone to Breckenridge at Covent Garden. I asked her if there was another with a broad tail. She said yes, and that they were so alike she herself couldn't tell them apart. Hmm. Looks like he got mixed up with another goose that had a barbed tail. Well, I ran to his, I ran to this man Breckenridge, but he'd sold them all. You know the rest. My sister thinks that I'm going mad. If only she knew, I think I might be. Now I am a thief myself. I never even touched the wealth for which I sold my character. He burst into sobs and buried his face in his hands. There was a long silence, broken only by Sherlock Holmes tapping his fingertips on the table. Suddenly, my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out, he said. What, sir? Oh, heaven bless you. No more words. Get out! No more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, the bang of a door, and the crisp rattle of running footfalls from the street. After all, Watson, said Holmes, Horner is not in danger. Ryder will not speak against him, and the stone will be returned, so the case will fall apart. Perhaps I am committing a crime, but perhaps I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again. He is too frightened. If we send him to jail now, it will make him a jailbird for life. He reached for his clay pipe. Besides, he concluded, it is the season of forgiveness. Chance sent us the most entertaining problem, and solving it has been its own reward. Now, Doctor, if you will join me, we will begin another investigation, in which also a bird will be the most delicious object. And that was the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, everybody. Thanks for joining me today.